in this episode of the Critical Oxygen Podcast. How do you best prepare for altitude or for racing at altitude? And so looking at that is like, how long, what is the time course for adaptations? How long do they stick around? And is intermittent, intermittent exposure effective? Welcome to the Critical Oxygen Podcast, where we help you optimize your physiology and maximize your endurance potential. I'm your host, Phil Batterson. I have a PhD in molecular exercise physiology and I'm the founder of Critical Oxygen, where my mission is to build better endurance athletes through remote education and in-person physiological testing. Today, I'm joined by Dave Shell, founder and head coach of Kaizen Endurance for another episode of Fast Physiology, where we do a succinct dive into a single endurance topic. Today's topic is how to maximize your ability to perform and race in high altitude environments. Enjoy. Dave, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, as always, these are always uh, fun conversations, especially our offline, you know, kind of uh, yeah. flurry of texts about, you know, a few hours to a day before um, recording these fast physiology topics. So one of them that you suggested to me was you wanted to talk about altitude. Yes. Um, and altitude training. So can you give uh, the listeners just a little bit of context as to why you want to talk about altitude and what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today? Yeah. So I think um, in general, I live in Colorado and a lot of my athletes live or come race here. Um, so I live around mm -hmm. 5,000 feet or just under 2,000 meters. Um, and a lot of times mountain biking, we might be racing at 8,000 feet up to 10 plus thousand feet. And so... Um, I think the things that I want to get out of this is one, how do you best prepare for altitude or for racing at altitude? And so looking mm -hmm. at that is like, how long, what is the time course for adaptations? How long do they stick around? And is intermittent, intermittent exposure effective for altitude? Cause I think mm -hmm. I get that a lot too with athletes that think, you know, six weeks out from a race, they're going to go spend a day at altitude and that's going to prepare them for it. So <laughs> Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's the groundwork there. Cool. Yeah. I would say, uh, just, just for everybody who is kind of interested in why altitude sucks so bad for your performance. Um, the main thing that is changing when you're going from say sea level to altitude is the amount of, uh, air particles that are pressing down on you is actually less. And with that decrease in air particles, you get decreased pressures of oxygen and that results in oxygen not being able to be pushed into your your body and into your muscles as effectively so um, from that perspective you lose uh, maximal oxygen consumption capabilities so your vo2 max will go down shifts in vo2 max result in changes to maximal aerobic capacity or uh, maximal sustainable exercise intensity um, and there, there were a couple studies that actually looked at, you know, like the amount of decline that you had mm -hmm. in terms of your ability to uh, maintain a, ro a sustainable pace. And I think it's like anywhere from five to 12% decrease in, in that number. Of course, that is uh, highly individual. So the, 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 the amount that you're going to be affected by altitude is uh, going to be affected by a million different things. Um, some people, myself included, super, super uh, sensitive to altitude. So even when I was living out in Colorado, it took me like two years to actually adapt to uh, living in Colorado Springs, which is, I think it's only like 4,800 feet um, above sea level. So that's not even, that, that's not even deemed as like high altitude. Right. Um, and it still took me a really long time. And I was still, you know, affected a lot by, um, by the altitude, even two years into it, other people really have no issues. So, so that's, that's kind of the, the first thing is that because of the decrease in, uh, the amount of pressure of the air on top of you, when you go up to altitude, you're going to run out or have less oxygen, uh, push or less oxygen gradient. So you get less oxygen into your muscles, less oxygen into your muscles means your mitochondria are going to be, uh, kind of fighting to use that oxygen. And what we see is you, you actually, when, when people are not acclimated to altitude, they actually have a higher tendency to burn carbohydrates right. when they first get exposed, just because, uh, 
the exercise intensities that people typically engage in are um, high, a higher relative percentage of their maximum. Um, so then they're going to be resulting in u- utilizing and using more carbohydrates. And um, I just want to add, so, so you had mentioned that the reduction in your max sustainable effort, power, whatever we want to call it, is around 5 to 10%. And I've like a rule of thumb that I've used, even though, like you said, it's very individual, is essentially like mm-hmm. 1% per 1,000 feet above sea level. So if you're going to 5,000 feet, hmm. you might expect around a 5% reduction in FTP or critical power. And at 10,000 feet, 10%. And like you said, like that's a bell mm-hmm. curve. And of course, there's going to be people on, people on either side. But I think it's a good kind of rule of thumb to at least like, if you're preparing to go somewhere, like trying to like determine what your goal pace would be or something like that, using that as yeah. like to set realistic expectations. Yeah. And I, I, we should also add that it's, it's over the entire spectrum of exercise intensities. It's not just high intensity exercise. It's, it's from really low exercise intensities to really high exercise intensities. Everything is going to cause your physiology to work harder. So what you'll even notice is that sometimes even at rest, when you go up to high altitude, your resting heart rate is jacked up through the roof. Like it could be 90 or a hundred. And that's an indication that your body is not getting enough oxygen, most likely also, uh, you know, creating more CO2 at the same time. And your body is just struggling physiologically to keep up. So, um, that's another thing to, to note. Um, and I, I like that idea of like, I, I think a good starting point is 1% per thousand feet above sea level. Um, but the true way to know it is right. obviously get to, you know, wherever you're racing early enough that you can do some test rides at the speed that you're hoping to race your race. And then if it's way too hard, <laughs> obviously back it off even more. Um, I think that's like the biggest thing, especially, you, you know, you you coach a lot of athletes who are going up to Leadville, right? Mm-hmm. Where like the lowest is like maybe 9,000 feet and the highest is 12,000 feet. And you're undulating between that. That is a, a very large stress just due to the altitude. Right. Um, so, so whenever I talk to people about this, I'm, I say, you know, err on the side of caution, right? You know, you, you, in an eight to eight to 12 hour race, I would probably say is, is typically Leadville. Um, you stand to gain a lot more time if you go out conservatively and then can maintain that rather than being stubborn and being like, oh, well, Dave said it was, uh, you know, 1% per thousand feet. And, you know, you reduce that, that 1%. And then all of a sudden your heart rate's 160, you know, 10 miles in and you're holding that, you know, 160, 170 and your max heart rate's 180. You're, you're headed to a bad place. And I think that's a great, I mean, not that this is a Leadville episode, but I, I think that's where heart rate can become a really valuable tool is for my Mm -hmm. athletes. A lot of times I'll set a cap. And like you said, it's like just at rest, your heart rate's already higher. And so like using that as like a, a ceiling and telling them like, really try to not go above this. And typically we say like mid to high zone three, if we're using a five zone model. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's just indicative. And as you get more fatigued in that race and dehydrated and are running out of fuel and your heart rate's getting higher and higher, it's like, it really holds you back, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those longer races just in general, there's a lot more room for error in terms of, you know, nutritional hydration, other things like that. And, you definitely do not want to go out too hard. That's when you have a really, really bad day. Well, and you had mentioned that just in general, your body's having to, so essentially your aerobic ceiling has been lowered as you're going up to mm-hmm. higher elevation. So your body's, it's more energy cost for every intensity. And so at mm-hmm. that altitude, you go into, if you go into the red, it's really hard to crawl back out of that hole. And because you're, yeah. um, the idea of like exercise, what is it? Excess post oxygen consumption, exercise, excess post oxygen Mm -hmm. consumption. And so if you do a hard interval above critical power or whatever FTP to pay that back is going to take longer because there's less oxygen. And so if you go out too hard, you're going to be paying for it dearly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And on top of that, you're, uh, 
most likely going to be more reliant on carbohydrate, you know, for lower exercise intensities as well. So that's going to be depleting that finite amount of carbohydrate stores even faster, which can then <laughs> lead to other issues, you know, further, further on down the race. Um, so, okay. So that's how, that's kind of how altitude would affect you. Next, let's talk about, you know, it's like who, if anyone, should be engaging in altitude training and what's like minimum dosage and other things like that. Do you think, do you think that's a good way to go or do you have No, I think like first let's talk about how long do the, I mean, so you had mentioned that you lived in Colorado Springs for two years and you still didn't feel like you were really acclimated. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about like what the literature says as far as what the adjustment period is. And in my mind, I always yeah. have like, just in coaching in general, I have all these like time frames or whatever, these rolling averages. And so the way I see it, like you go up to elevation and the first day is maybe not too bad, but then in the second and third day, you really start to feel the effects. And then after four five, six, then it starts to, you start to like come back out. You're still not fully acclimatized, but you're going to be feeling mm -hmm. the effects less. So yeah, I guess, can you speak to that? Like what does the literature show in terms of kind of the time frame? Yeah. No, I think I think you nailed it. You know, first day you generally don't feel too bad because your body hasn't had a chance to be like, "Oh shit, I'm dehydrated because I'm breathing too hard." You know, because because another yeah. effect of altitude is you actually start to breathe faster, and by breathing faster, you dehydrate yourself more, um, and then you lower your plasma, uh, your plasma within right. your blood, so your blood uh, volume actually contracts. Um, so, but that takes about a day to present itself. So then day two and day three, and this is where people are like, do not race at altitude day two and day three after right. getting there, because that is like when your body is like feeling the most stress of it, you're probably depleted carbohydrate stores. Cause again, your body is in a stress mode. So you're, <laughs> you're in stress mode. So you're going to be burning more carbohydrates, just doing, uh, you know, activities of everyday living. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's one day. You know, you could you could probably get away with racing, not be acclimated or anything like that. Then get the hell out of there because <laughs> the day afterwards is going to be really rough. Um, two to three days, absolutely not. That's kind of when your body is feeling it the worst, and then you start to come, and then you start to kind of you know have like an upward trajectory. And I don't know exactly the time frame of like that upward trajectory, but like when people, when elite level athletes do training camps. Um, they found that maximal hemoglobin uh, stimulation occurs between about 20, I think 23 to 28 oh, days. Um, so it takes about four weeks to get a maximal, uh, you know, acclimation stimulus, you know, to, to that altitude. And that could be a very expensive four weeks especially if you're going up into these mountain towns, renting an Airbnb, traveling out there, doing other things like that. Um, and then when you come back down from altitude, I think it's like you have maybe like 10 days of those benefits yeah. lasting. So, so it's, it's all in all, it's, it's very short, um, short adaptations that revert themselves really quickly. And I think in general, um, because elite level populations tend to use altitude training to stimulate hemoglobin mass increases and other things like that, us non-professional athletes think that we need to be doing altitude training. Um, but I was watching a YouTube video, a really, really well done YouTube video today, and I can't remember exactly um, who it was, but he was talking about uh, – he was he was citing some research, and the conclusion for some of this research was that – Altitude training resulted in most likely less than a 1% gain in performance overall. Yeah. Um, and I think this is, you know, so <laughs> so if, if a less than 1% gain in performance is worth, you know, ten dollars or $20,000 for you to go up and do a training camp and do other things like that, and then by all means, if you have that expendable income, that's awesome. But uh, it, it's, it's a lot of money for very, very marginal gains. Whereas, um, you know, there's other training things that you could be doing that could potentially mitigate some of that. Now I will say 
the single best way to get prepared for altitude is to go to altitude and train at altitude. Um, law of specificity, right, Dave? Yeah, I, I think yes to an effect. Um, I, I would say from yeah. my, so again, I, I'm coaching a lot of athletes that don't, maybe they don't have all the money in the world. And so it is like, we have to be practical about it too. And so I think in an ideal situation, if they could show up 10 to 14 days before the race, that's great. Mm-hmm. A mm-hmm. lot of people can't. And so then we're trying to maybe it's like either like I'll tell them a lot of times you either need to show up like four plus days out or show up within two days to kind of like mitigate yep. those things. But also yep. if you spend too much time at altitude, you can, you're not working at the same work rate or power as you right. were at your lower altitude. And so you can start to lose those gains. And so I, I mean, mm-hmm. I think the literature shows or, or the things, maybe this is outdated at this point, but it's like the whole, um, live high or sleep high train low thing you know so it's like spend yep. a lot of time at elevation so that you get those adaptations that you're looking for but then train at a lower elevation so you can hit those high power numbers and so right so yeah i think it, so that's one piece of it um and as i mentioned at the start of this i think a lot of times athletes want to go or maybe it's like weeks out and they want to go like train at at elevation but i think maybe there's a psychological impact there and it makes you feel good or like maybe Mm -hmm. gives you an idea how you're going to handle it but as far as like physiological adaptations like you're not going to get it from one day and it's not going to last that long anyway so it's like the time you spend in the car driving up and down the mountain and all these other things might have been time better spent on your bike or running or what have you Mm -hmm. yeah i would i would say so i've i've heard and i don't know uh, like the physiological underpinnings of this, but I've heard like one or two days of exposure here and there to very high altitude for, you know, extended periods of time, like 24 hours Mm -hmm. at a time, um, can actually help reduce or mitigate the effects of going back up to altitude. Um, you know, even if it's like one day, I, I think, you know, your, your body, probably has some sort of mechanisms whether it's uh epigenetic or you know other factors that allow it then to switch back and forth if you are being exposed to it uh but again i don't i don't know precisely what's going on there um so i i think for example somebody who's living in uh in colorado if you can get out and go expose yourself to really high altitude, like going up to Breckenridge or going up, you know, into like the the mountain towns and stuff like that, you don't have to do anything hard. Right. Like you could just go and do like a really, really easy ride and just expose yourself, you know, maybe spend the night there and then, you know, come back the next day to a long weekend. And, you know, perhaps from a psychological and maybe slightly from a physiological perspective, you'd be able to gain some, small benefits um and then the idea of like the live high train low then people are like well you know do i need to go get an altitude tent and then sleep in my altitude tent all the time and i i don't think so because again it's very marginal gains in terms of the the overall uh you know needle mover isn't going to be the fact that you slept in your altitude tent and the exposure that you need for altitude is it's um it's it's dose dependent so it's how long right. you're uh, at that altitude and then how high you actually are but one of the issues you can run into is that if you can't expose yourself to enough altitude per day by being in your altitude tent cuz i think you need like 12 plus plus hours at like that's what i've heard 2 to 2500 yeah, feet yeah i've heard I, I think they did a study at the um olympic training center in colorado springs where they have this awesome like heat and altitude room and all the stuff and it like yeah it was mm-hmm. like 12 to 16 hours a day for X amount of weight. And so it's like, you have to live in there essentially, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then if it's, if it's just on your bed, it's like, what are you going to do? Lay in bed all day? Cause that's probably not very good. Yeah. Then you have atrophy. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, so it's all, all these balances and stuff like that. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I think the big things that, that a, that athletes can do, that are going to be racing at altitude is going to, if you can, you know, do like a training camp 
a few months beforehand just to just to get a little bit of exposure to the altitude, how your body reacts to it, um, what sort of interventions like hydration is super, super important when you go up to altitude. Maybe eating a higher carbohydrate diet leading into your race could be, you know, a good uh, a good thing. And then managing how you are approaching and getting into the altitude before your race. So like Dave, you were saying, you know, six to 10 days, maybe 14 days out, that would be an ideal time to get to the altitude. Right. Your first few days, you're doing nothing. You're, you're barely, you're, you're kind of puttering along, you know, just seeing how your body's responding. Hayes in the barn at that point. So you're not going to, you know, gain a ton of fitness, but you stand to lose a lot if you injure yourself or get sick or something along right. those lines. Then as you start to come back, you know, after the, the three, four day mark, then you can start to be like, okay, maybe I'll do one or two race efforts, go scout the course, do something like that, see how my body is responding and see where, uh, you know, what heart rate I should be targeting. Um, so I think that's kind of like the best way for an athlete to approach it. And if you can't do the, the six to 14 days beforehand, then you essentially get there the day of yeah. the race, do the race get out yeah. of there. Like, because you're, you're <laughs> going into the race, you're going to be fine because your body hasn't had a chance to catch up on all that stress. But after that, you, you're going to be wrecked. And by staying at that super high altitude, you're going to get wrecked even further. So, um, and all, all things to be said, I always recommend my athletes get your, get your iron levels checked, your, your ferritin checked, your hemoglobin levels checked, other things like that. Cause that could be an early mark to say, A, you're not going to be able to respond to that altitude training. And then B, you're not going to, uh, you know, have a, an effective amount of oxygen carrying capacity. So you're really going right. to struggle when you, when you get up to get up to altitude. Yeah. And, and I think the last thing I'll say, or maybe not the last thing I've got a bad habit of that, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of times people maybe give like you need to respect it, but don't fear it. And I think sometimes people give altitude yeah. too much respect to the point where it gets in their head and, and things like that. It's like, you don't know. Yeah. And, and like, even if you race there one time and had a horrible experience, maybe this time you won't. And I it like, so mm -hmm. you really just have to like be in tune and like take what you're given that day and like listen to what your body's telling you, but don't, Yep. Because it, it just turns into a downward spiral. If you're like trying to hit the same power that you typically do, or like, you know, going too hard, like you said, um, recipe for disaster. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, because we're, we're coming up on time. I'll give people this as a takeaway. If you're going to be racing at altitude, do not go by power. You got to use something that's an internal variable. So using something like heart rate, using something like RPE, making sure you're staying up on top of your hydration and your carbohydrate intake. Obviously don't do anything new on race day, but in terms of giving altitude the respect it deserves, that's how you do it. And there are race strategies that you can implement in order to mitigate those effects. Always start conservatively. Um, that's, that's my biggest recommendation is like you, you stand to gain a lot more after everybody else who, you know, didn't go start conservatively, just starts dropping back you start passing them, trust your fitness, trust your training and just reduce, just reduce your output. It's, it's there. Those are long races that you're typically doing in those high mountain, uh, mountain biking races or trail running races or whatever it is you're doing. So, uh, those are, those would be my, what I would be preaching to my athletes if they were doing those high altitude races. I like it. Cool. All right. So that was another episode of fast physiology. We hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions about uh, altitude training, altitude in general, how it affects your physiology, reach out to Dave or myself. You can always find me on Instagram at critical O2. You can find Dave on Instagram at Kaizen endurance. Um, yeah, we're always open to, to answering questions and stuff like that. So uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.